As engineers, we often want to become project managers and leaders in our organizations. However, there are things that we don't learn about project management in a typical project management training program like risk identification. How do you identify and prepare yourself for major risks, especially on complex infrastructure projects? There's also things we need to think about like managing people and stakeholders and getting involved and thinking about things that could derail our projects. Well, in this episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I have with me William Hedea. William is a licensed professional engineer. He's also the president and CEO of WMH Corporation. And he's gonna share some valuable insights to becoming a leader in a consulting firm and dealing with things like project risks and stakeholders and funding and policy and things that we don't learn about in engineering school. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest on to the show today. William Hedaya is a licensed professional engineer and president and CEO at WMH Corporation. William, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you. So, William, just to get us started off, tell us a little bit about WMH. Where are you located? What kind of services do you provide? About how how big is the company? Sure. WMH was founded in 2008, really at the beginning of the recession, as you can remember. Uh, we are an engineering consulting firm. We design major transportation infrastructure. That's really the thrust of the company. Uh, we are headquartered in San Jose, California. We have offices in Sacramento, Oakland, and San Diego. I would say we're a mid-sized firm, but we do enjoy working on some major large infrastructure projects, you know, ranging 100 million construction costs all the way up to half a billion, I would say. Very interesting type of projects, uh, other than transportation, interchange, you know, most of our work, I would say 99% is uh, on the California state highway system. Uh, we do deal with quite a bit of cities that, that touch their freeways, their interchanges, or what, what have you. We also do get involved in some special type projects similar to truck inspection facilities. We've designed one in Cordelia, which is in Fairfield. A uh, very interesting project, very highly technical. I could expand a little bit more on that. We also have a division that is uh, managing and procuring the mini cell towers for the next 5 and 6G telecom industry, which is really interesting. Uh, started as a joint venture with WMH, Philips Lighting, and uh, uh, Ericsson. So these are the mini cell towers. We use the electroliers that the cities would have, and then we replace them with these high-tech mini antennas. Uh, so that's the type of work that we do. You know, we're, we're, I would say we're a mid-sized firm. We really enjoy the fact that we are a mid-sized and yet be able to manage and handle big major infrastructure projects. Wow, that's great. And William, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your career journey. You're an engineer. You were, you know, you've worked as a project manager for large infrastructure projects. And now you're, of course, a leader in the organization. Tell us a little bit about how your career has evolved over time. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> the shorter version of it. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> just as a background, uh, I'm uh, originally from Beirut, Lebanon. We uh, Unfortunately, we had a civil war for many years. So my goal was to really come and finish my education in the United States, then get back to my country and build the infrastructure that's been destroyed during war. So I did my undergrad at Ohio State University one of the very few universities that really accepted me. I had to go through a lot of immigration procedure to get accepted. Uh, then did my master's in civil engineering. That's really what drove me to become a civil engineer. I wanted to go back and build stuff. And, and that's actually the best part of our business, quite frankly. And I say that to all the young engineers. So make long story short, the war lasted a lot longer than expected and decided to remain in the United States. And that was really a very good decision. Do. So I worked for major infrastructure firms at the time. It was the largest engineering firm in the country. Really learned a lot from them. Uh, I was their integration manager toward the last couple of years with that firm. And I was in charge of the mergers and acquisitions that that company would acquire in different parts of the world. Then I came back with another engineering firm back to the Bay Area. I was stationed in London for a while. Then I came back. 
to the Bay Area and, and this company that, that recruited me, you know, had bought another engineering firm and they want me to manage it. So that's really how I ended up in the San Jose area, in the, the South Bay in the Bay Area, which, you know, I've been here for the last, I would say, 25 years or so. Uh, and then, you know, I was project manager, project engineer, uh, really did several designs of highways and infrastructure projects. And then, you know, as the path for almost every manager is to really know your civil design background and then proceed to managing projects, uh, managing people, uh, mentoring people and growing your staff. And that's really the key for every manager, I would say. And uh, then decided to take a deep breath and I started this company in 2008 and we've really enjoyed the fact that you know a lot of the companies I've worked with a lot of senior managers really were very supportive and the clients were extremely supportive and that's really what's keeping the company uh, moving forward and expanding so yeah this is really my career you know I love civil engineering and I had a purpose why to get into the civil engineering and uh, we do a lot of promotions now, you know, for civil engineers, you know, whether they're in high school, whether they're in colleges, we try to lure them into a civil engineering firm, which, you know, I really appreciate what, what you're doing to promote our industry. As you know, you know, it's not easy to find civil engineers these days and I'm sure every company is, is dealing with that as well. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's really now my goal is to mentor folks, uh, promote the civil engineering industry, support clients, and, uh, and mentor younger staff. That's great. And so as an executive in a major corporation, obviously, you've led multifaceted design teams that have worked on, you know, over a billion dollars in infrastructure projects. Can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the highlights and some of the challenges that you kind of face on these infrastructure projects? They're very involved, they're very complex. Maybe you could just share a few highlights and challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would I would say communications and, and really uh, maintaining an eye on the schedule, maintaining an eye on the long lead items. A uh, lot of risks and challenges sometimes are really beyond your control on these major infrastructure projects. You got a bunch of utilities that need to be relocated. Utility companies are too busy. Your project is not their priority. A uh, lot of uh, politics, I would say, you know, where the funding comes from, uh, what the funding deadlines are and how you meet those and how you really incorporate your schedule to be able to meet those funding deadlines. And as you can imagine, with these large projects, the funding is not always there. You know, they would have several parts. You do the preliminary engineering, you go with the final design, yet the construction money isn't there. So you sometimes have to tailor your project, your design to the available funding. Uh, this is so interesting though. I mean, th this is what really makes our projects very exciting. This is what makes our job so exciting. You know, it's not just literally designing a project. I would say our delivery on these projects would be probably 30% engineering and the rest is really everything else, communication, funding, uh, timelines, schedules, uh, risks that you have to mitigate. So we have, you know, we have special ways to mitigate some of these risks, how to keep track of them. We have the matrices that we follow, we keep track of different things. We have continuous meetings with all stakeholders, to keep the public involved, keep the stakeholders, the, the owners of the projects involved. A lot of our projects really have to revolve around the Caltrans state system. So we have great relationships with Caltrans, which really helps to navigate through their system and their policies and everything else. Uh, so that, that, I would say, you know, communications and really uh, keeping an eye on, on all the different elements that are beyond your control. You know, we yeah. can design. No, I was going to say, I think that like what you highlight there is really important because I think when you become a project manager or when you're thinking about becoming a project manager, you know, what we immediately think about is scoping, scheduling, and budgeting of our projects. But you've mentioned some of the things that sometimes, especially younger professionals aren't aware of, like the funding, the politics, you know, having these different types of discussions that keep the projects moving that, 
you know, you don't necessarily learn about in a project management training or, you know, a, a school curriculum that you really have to kind of learn on the job and get more comfortable with, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. C critical factor. So another critical factor in project management and leadership in general in the consulting world is stakeholders. Mega infrastructure projects often involve collaboration with various stakeholders. So how do you approach kind of building and maintaining effective partnerships and relationships with stakeholders on your projects? You know, this is a really important point. I mean, we need to get the stakeholders involved in our design. We try not to go in a vacuum, design what we think is the best thing for them, and then presenting it to them. And I think that kind of, it's, it's more of a process that, that may not flow very well with them. So what we do is we tell them about the project, we tell them what the goals are, what the purpose and need of this project, and how it would impact their facilities, and what is it that we can do to help them you know, mitigate these impacts. Uh, you know, is it the right of way take? Is it a change in, in their business environment? Uh, some of the projects that we do, which now are, are you know, which is great because we do complete streets, we do different types of modes, bikes, pads, safety, uh, trying to attract more pedestrian to the local areas, and that really helps their business. So we try to kind of show them the advantages of this project that, that we're trying to do, get them involved from day one, and, and not just do the design in the background and then just present it to them, you know, make them involved in the whole process, let them know what the schedule is, what phases of the project we're in. Uh, and that's extremely important. I mean, it really is. Because stakeholders, you know, they, they literally are the owners of the projects eventually. Yeah. And while we're on this subject of kind of project leadership, project management, keeping projects moving, something that another thing that I think younger project managers or less experienced project managers are not well versed in, William, is risk, risk identification, risk management. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, risk, like having that eye for risk and, you know, how do you identify risks on your projects and what steps might you take to mitigate them? Can you talk about risk? Yeah, absolutely. Well, different types of risk. I mean, you, you know, you have schedule risks, you have budget risks, you also have design risks. You know, we do a lot of underground facilities, relocation of, of utilities. We have, you know, drainage structures. We do foundations of major bridges. Just want to make sure that you really do uh, the right detailed design to make sure that you do avoid these utilities and not get any surprises during construction. So, I mean, everything that we design, everything we do really is going to end up on the field. Uh, so that's very important. You know, we do a lot of potholing, we determine, you know, the best of our knowledge. And even with doing all the engineering to the best standard of care that we can, you do run into some of these issues. So when that happens on the field, and it does happen on many projects, you just have to be very proactive. You just have to jump in, be very sensitive to the schedule of the contractor, very sensitive to the whole situation, and really come up with a solution. And it happens, and many clients really appreciate the fact that, that we were so protect, proactive during that. The other risk are schedule risk. Like I mentioned earlier, you, know, you could really lose the funding on a major infrastructure project if you don't meet the deadline. So what is it that you do? You try to anticipate a lot of these issues. You try to eliminate the issues before they really happen. And, and, and this is you know, where, where the technical background, the lessons learned of these project managers and, and, and how the younger folks really would learn from these seasoned project managers is how to deal with those risks and how to avoid them. Um, funding risks, you know, situations change, you know, you mm. get the recession, then you do have uh, most of our projects really come from sales tax revenue. As you can imagine, with self help counties, and most of the counties in California. So, when the sales tax revenue projections are slowing down, a lot of these, you know, transportation authorities do pull some of these projects back. They have to prioritize what projects they have and so forth. So, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Do you, you know, rescope the project to make it a little bit smaller. And so these are the type of risks that, that you always you know, have to deal with in, in our industry. A lot of, lot of the, you know, we don't have controls on a lot of things, quite frankly. There's so many outside uh, factors that affect our daily lives and our project management and our styles and everything we do. So 
it is interesting, but it is also, you know, not always easy to complete and deliver these major infrastructure projects. But that's the fun of it. That's what we do. Yeah, and I think from just doing a lot of project management training and building some project management programs for firms, one of the things I can recommend is in the planning stages of your progress, whether you're doing a project management plan or something along those lines, to really go through like a risk identification process and brainstorming process, right, with the stakeholders, with internally, externally, so that you understand what those risks are and you could have like a plan in place if one of those risks were to come to reality, like, you know, what are we going to do if this happens? Right. Um, because then you're making everyone think through that. And and one thing that William said, I think that's also really important that we've learned from working with a lot of firms on the project management side is doing a lessons learned at the end of your projects is absolutely fundamental in my opinion, because I think that's one of the biggest kind of failures of consulting firms in today's world is, you're not sharing knowledge well enough between project managers and professionals within your organization. If you just had a project manager that went through an awesome project and did a great job and they've got a lot of takeaways that they can share with the other PMs, it's a win. On the flip side, if they another project manager did a project that was over budget by you know, 10, 20%, they can hopefully identify why and then again, share it with other project managers in the firm. And I think the more you do that, the more savvy your PMs become the more savvy they get around risk identification and, and handling risk. And to me, it's an easy way to, it's an easy thing to do. You're just leveraging other knowledge. You just have to make it a point to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's really important that you have to do it. I, mean, I don't think you have a choice doing that. And what I like to do actually <clears throat> is have some of my young engineers go out to the field and see what the design uh, getting built. And we do ask Caltrans to kind of give us a tour sometimes on some of these projects. Uh, of course, you know, we have to follow all the safety measures that they have on the construction field sites. So it is it's really rewarding to see what you've designed and spent a couple of years, you know, behind the computer and behind the desk doing to see that coming to fruition. And learning, you know, there's a lot of issues that you learn, you know, when you go out on the field and you see the after the construction is done and you're absolutely right you know most of our project as as you know you know after you're done with the design you have a separate contract with the client to basically do design services during construction and we respond to rfis we coordinate with the contractor we do shop drawings and that kind of gives you another really good point and good feeling to see you know how you know the contractors are extremely smart you know how they did something a little bit different than how we designed it and that knowledge has to translate to the design team and learn from that as well. So, you know, we tend to learn from the contractor. We tend to learn from prior projects or project managers. Like you said, lessons learned are extremely important. How to disseminate that to our staff is, is just as important. Yeah. And like you said, you're learning from, you can learn from everybody involved in the project, the contractor, the owner, your team members, other consultants, architects, et cetera, that you might work with. There's always opportunities for learning. And, and then it's kind of on you to share that information back with your team. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit here. You're also responsible for mergers and acquisitions. Um, and I know that in today's world, infrastructure world, firms are growing fast. There's a lot of M&A going on. Could you just talk a little bit about that process, kind of how you navigate the complexities of reviewing new acquisitions, financial decisions, capital commitments during these processes? Just give us like an overview from your perspective on it. This is really a great experience that, you know, I happened to fall in my lab, quite frankly, when I was working for Parsons Brinkerhoff, you know, many, many years ago which is now WSP, uh, you know, I did learn quite a bit from them and I really do appreciate everything I've learned from them. And it's funny that, that you know, that you brought up that that issue because we team together all the time, Parsons Brinkerhoff or WSP and I and all the prior firms that I work with. Uh, so WMH really is my third company. And, uh, so I haven't, you know, throughout my 35 years career, I'm, oops, this is probably my last stop, I hope. But... <laughs> But uh, the integration process and the mergers and acquisition is really interesting. I mean, it kind of gives you an overall view of how the overall business works. So when you join a firm, you join a company, the systems are there, the timesheet system is there, your project cost accounting system is there. But when you're integrating a firm, when you're bringing another firm to the fold, you 
really have to merge all these different systems that they use. So at one of my positions as an integration manager, I had close to 50 people from Deloitte and Touche helping me with assessing where the physical projects are, physical completion of the projects. You know, like we're buying a firm and, and you kind of have an idea where, where the projects are financially, but you don't know physically where they are. You know, I mean, they could be 80% spent financially, but really you're at 50% completion. So that was, you know, the trickiest part of really evaluating where, where these projects are. So we do have some measures to kind of keep track of those and how do we assess, you know, what the final price that, that, that depends on these projects is and what the risks are, you know. A lot of interviews with the project managers uh, and really you do learn quite a bit. And that, that experience helped me quite a bit starting WMH, quite frankly. Like I said, you know, you could be working for, for you know, 20 years in a company where you use their system, but you really actually know how those systems were developed. You really know the purpose and the background of some of these policies that we use. Uh, and, and from the smaller firms that we've acquired, as a matter of fact, you actually learn a lot from their principles. Because those people are smart business people. They're very successful, and that's one of the reasons we really want to bring them into the fold. That's the reason we want to have them join us. And, and a funny example, you know, there'd be some policies that we would try to implement on them and say, why are you guys even doing that? You know, this was an IRS policy that was, you know, relinquished 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and, you know, you're working in a big, large infrastructure. Some of these policies really kind of lose the meaning why they're there. And so that's something that, you know, you have to pay attention with is, you know, not create more bureaucracy, but reduce bureaucracy. And you get to a certain size and, and you know, you really have a choice. You're either going to have to deal with bureaucracy or chaos. So you do have to have these systems in place. You do have to have some of these policies in place. But those policies have to be efficient. They should not be creating more work for everybody else around. Uh, I mean, it was an interesting, you know, mm -hmm. and, and funny enough, some of these acquisitions that we've had, I'm still in touch with the principals. You know, of course, most of them have retired by now. Uh, and I still pick their brains on many, many issues. As a matter of fact, we just had dinner with, with one of the principals. He came to San Francisco. And uh, so it's great to see them. It kind of brings back some of these good memories and some of the good successes that we've had with these integrations and these acquisitions. Very interesting field. You know, I would encourage everyone that gets a chance to be involved in it, to really know how the whole business works, not just the engineering, not just the planning, not just managing of the project, but the overall picture of the business, which is very interesting. I think that's interesting. And I think a big takeaway from that is if you're working for a consulting firm and they acquire another firm or you or they are acquired. I think as a working professional there, you should understand that it's done for a reason, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. There's a lot of research that goes into it. So I know sometimes the initial thought process of an employee, there could be frustration, you know, either we don't want to grow or now someone's going to take my job or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, I think it's important to understand that your leadership is trying to grow your firm in the right way. And they've identified this acquisition as a way to do that. And I would recommend it's probably an opportunity for you as a professional to help with that integration, you know, and help things go smoothly and and, and embrace it, so to speak, um, knowing that there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. So I think that that's, I think sometimes, William, that's the, that's the appearance for people that, you know, that are working in the organization, but I think they need to know that it was, you know, there's, there's a, there's a plan behind it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, these acquisitions, all we try to do is maintain the people paying the staff, that's really the only asset we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, my assets go up and down the elevator every day. At the end of the day, I'm only left with liability and furniture. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else, you know? And so when you acquire a company or you are acquired, the only thing that you think of is, you know, how to grandfather their benefits, how to make sure that they're being accommodated. And as a matter of fact, the Companies that are acquired, the employees are treated extremely nice and, and probably even better than your current employees, tell you the truth. But, but that's what you have to do. I mean, you want to maintain. I mean, you're, you're, you're buying the assets of the company, which is the employees. You have nothing else. Right. So the last thing I want to ask you about is, you know, successful leadership 
is often associated with inspiring and empower the members of your team. So how do you encourage a culture of, you know, collaboration, creativity, and excellence within WMH Corporation? Well, I tell you, I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> it's really not uh, something that comes a little bit with, with the people you've been working with for many years. I mean, I have employees that have been with me for 32 years. I have some that have been with me for 25 years, and they moved three companies with me to this WMH. And, and I feel that, you know, the way you treat people is more important than anything else. The way you appreciate what they do and the way that, that you let them do whatever they need to do. You know, all my senior executives are way smarter than I am. So I stay out of their way. I, I let them do what they need to do. I listen to them. I suggest things, you know, and if they convince me otherwise, then I would go with what they say. And, and I think they look at someone to provide the support for them. That's really my job. I, I, you know, provide them with the staff that they need. I provide them with financial resources that they need, with the teaming arrangements to make them successful. Uh, you know, we, we literally, I mean, on most of our projects, we give out close to 35 to 40% of our revenue. We do hire a lot of sub-consultants and we team with a lot of firms. And, and that collaboration, you know, not just with our employees or our manager, but also with the external staff, you know, with, with companies I've worked with in the past. Now I'm working with them again under a different umbrella. And and how to really make their jobs easy, how to make sure that their sub-agreements is fair, how I, any instances, I do prepay a lot of my sub-consultants, as you know, you know, here it's pay when paid. And I don't always abide with that. Sometimes it's our fault. We don't submit an invoice. And it's not the subconsultant's fault. And so when a project manager is managing his job and he needs something really critical from the subconsultants, it does help to get these people on their way and, and, and make sure that. So that really facilitates my project manager's job as well. And again, you know, collaboration and lessons learned and, and mentoring is, is, is key any company's success you know you can't always find you know the, the perfect fit you have to grow them you have to find the young engineers you have to mentor them grow them and the advantage of the firm that we have is because we do have a lot of senior executives senior managers is people learn from it you know, people learn from these folks they they are mentored very well they work on exciting projects large infrastructure jobs and that that's really what we offer the employees it's, it's, growth pattern with a very comfortable environment. That's what I try to keep. That's great. And it sounds like you have a very collaborative approach to leadership where, like you said, you're listening to people. You may give advice from time to time, but you know, you kind of let them share their advice and recommendations and then work with them on that in a collaborative manner, which seems to be really important. Absolutely. Like I said, they're a lot smarter than I am. So <laughs> I have to listen to them. <laughs> All right. So, once again, William Hadaya. William is a licensed professional engineer, president and CEO at WMH Corporation. William, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today on the Civil Engineering CEO. Absolutely. And then, Andrew, I want to thank you for what you're doing for our industry and for, for bringing you know, all these experiences to life with these younger engineers. So thank you. All right. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with William. He's had a lot of experience on very big projects. He's done a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and he's very knowledgeable in the industry. And I hope that you can take some of what he said and leverage it into success in your career. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.